Good morning. My name is Pam. The Old Testament reading is found in Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 7. All of you who are thirsty, come to the water. Whoever has money, come buy food and eat. Without money, at no cost, buy wine and milk. Why spend money for what isn't food, and your earnings for what doesn't satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Enjoy the riches of feasts. Listen and come to me. Listen and you will live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful loyalty to David. Look, I made him a witness to the peoples, a prince and commander of peoples. Look, you will call a nation you don't know, a nation you don't know will run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel who has glorified you. Seek the Lord when he can be, still be found. Call him while he is yet near. Let the wicked abandon their ways and the sinful their schemes. Let them return to the Lord so that he may have mercy on them to our God because he is generous with forgiveness. The word of the Lord. Okay, so we come before his word. By the way, hi, my name is Greeting Search. My name is Marvin. <laughs> Y'all ought to know that by now, though. Let's uh, do this thing. We come before our king to praise him, to, to give him thanks. Well, let us do this. I'll be reading from Romans chapter 6, verses 22, 23. When you were a slave to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. I like to dig into that. Uh, <laughs> what consequences did you get from doing that which is now you are ashamed of? The outcome of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and become slaves to God, you have the consequence of holy life. You have a consequence of a holy life now. Oh, and the outcome is eternal life. Any outcome is eternal life. The wages of sin paid our debt. The pay is death. Death, that is. But God gives eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for standing for the gospel reading. It's found in Matthew 20, verses 8 through 16. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the workers and give them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and moving on finally to the first. When those who were hired at five in the afternoon came, each one received a denarian. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarian. When they received it, they grumbled against the landowner. These who were hired last worked one hour and they received the same pay as we did, even though we had to work the whole day in the hot sun. But he replied to one of them, friend, I did you no wrong. Didn't I agree to pay you a denarian? Take what belongs to you and go. I want to give to this one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want to do with what belongs to me? Or are you resentful because I am generous? So those who are last will be first, and those who are first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to our Lord Christ. Christ. Morning, everybody. Let's remain standing as we pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for your goodness to us. And Lord, we ask as we reflect on your, on your word, Lord, that you would, by your Holy Spirit, begin to open our eyes, open our mouths, open our ears, open our minds and our hearts, that we might see and hear and trust and believe in all that you're saying to us, Lord. Do this for the glory of your name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you be seated this morning? Amen. 
Have you, um, have you ever been cheated out of something you paid for? Uh, a couple, a couple of weeks ago, our little six-year-old Jane, who is like six going on 36, uh, we went to Chick-fil-A after dance recital day. It was like four recitals in one weekend, maybe five. I don't know. Lost count. And we went to Chick-fil-A to celebrate with our older girls and, you know, the whole family's there. And, and, um, and Jane gets back to the table and she's like, they didn't give me my lemonade. I said, no, that's, yeah, you're right, you know. And she's like, but we paid for the lemonade. I'm like, yeah, okay. And before, like, us saying, here, here's what you can do about that, she just goes right up to the counter. Like, she's going to get in line. She's going to talk to the person. And she walks back with her lemonade, you know. I'm surprised she didn't have, like, two in her hands after the whole thing. And, but she comes by it honestly because I had to smile because, you know, a, a month prior to that, I had gone through the drive through somewhere and they had not given me my lemonade. So I got to my spot and I drove back through the drive through and asked for my lemonade. So you see where Jane gets this from. But there's a, kind of, there's a kind of resentment that comes when we don't feel like we've gotten something that we're owed. There's a kind of resentment and an unfairness that said, you owed me this and you didn't give me this. But there's a different kind of resentment that comes when someone else gets what they didn't earn. So one kind of resentment is when you don't get what you're owed, but there's another kind where, you, where someone else gets what they didn't earn. And that's the kind of resentment that I want us to talk about today. In fact, actually kids, sh- sh- this shows up in kids at an early age. You might think about the, the first time kids say the phrase, that's not fair, it's not usually because they think they earned something and you ought to give them something. Usually it's because somebody else got something and they don't think it's fair. So why did Jonas get to have an ice cream because he went out to run errands with you? Or why did, you know, and so Charles Dickens said years ago, it's kids who have an acute sense of injustice in the world. They perceive when someone else is getting something that they didn't earn, hey, no fair. We're in a series called The Kingdom is Like, and it's based on the stories that Jesus told, the many parables that Jesus told. But we're particularly focusing on the stories that are found in Matthew's gospel. And in Matthew's gospel, Matthew uses this phrase, has Jesus using this phrase, um, the kingdom of heaven. Now, whenever you and I hear the word heaven, we tend to think about the afterlife and what's coming next. But when Jesus says in in Matthew's gospel, the kingdom of heaven, he's not talking about the future or the afterlife. He's talking about the Lord of heaven and earth who has come to reign and what his reign looks like. It's Matthew's gospel that records the Lord's prayer that we prayed this morning where it says, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so this language of the kingdom of heaven is saying to us, there's a place where God reigns and his will is done and we want that same thing to happen here on earth earth. So as we go through the series, what we're asking ourselves is, okay, so what does it look like to actually live under Jesus's reign? Now, a minute here about today. Today, as Malachi and Becca said in the video, is Ascension Sunday. But what do we do with that? I mean, just a little uh, moment here just to ask that question. What's the ascension of Jesus all about? Maybe you've seen some weird pictures or paintings of like Jesus going up in the clouds. And is this like uh, some sort of primitive spaceman returning to his planet? You know, is this like E.T. except it's J.C. goes home, you know? I mean, what's the... When you think of ascension, you're meant to think of it as ascending to a throne. Ancient thrones were up on steps in this high place. And so there's a sense in which when Jesus speaks of ascending, it's saying, I'm going to take the place of control and rule now. I'm going up to the throne. There's an enthronement. But it's also meant to echo for us the story of Elijah and Elisha. And just a brief word about that. When Elijah's this prophet and he does all these miracles and he's doing God's work and Elisha is like his understudy and Elisha says, hey, I want your mantle. I want what you have. I want to be able to carry on your work. And Elijah says, actually, you're going to get twice that. You're going to get double, a double portion of this anointing. And he says, here's how you'll know it. You'll know that you've received power when you see me being taken up. That's what Luke has in mind in in the book of Acts when Luke tells the story of Jesus saying to his disciples, you shall receive 
power to be my witnesses. And then the heavens opened up and they watched him being taken up. Well, that's not a random story. That's a story that's meant to link back to Elijah and Elisha. So what's the ascension all about? Jesus' enthronement and our empowerment. His enthronement and our empowerment. So that's important. It's, it's, it's important for us to say that today on Ascension Sunday, but particularly when we're in this series to say, we're not just talking about some cute stories that Jesus told and then we say, well, oh well, I don't have any power to live this way. No, no, no. If Jesus is on the throne, that means you have the power of the Spirit to live under his reign. Amen? So hear these stories with that kind of a heart. Hear these stories as not like, oh, it's just a cute little Aesop's fable, Jesus style, morality. So no, hear it with like, okay, God, how should we live differently by the power of the Spirit because you are on the throne? Amen? All right, that's a long, that's a long preamble, but here we go. Matthew 20 is the story of, uh, in, in our Bibles, uh, many times the headline uh, over this parable, uh, it's called Workers in the Vineyard. But I'd like to suggest to you that it's actually a story of a generous business owner. The focus of the story is not on the workers themselves, but on the person who owns the land. So verse 1, the kingdom of heaven is like, and he doesn't say is like workers in a vineyard. He says the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. Now, just a brief word about context here. In the, in the first century world, kind of the, 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 the place that you wanted to get to was to be a landowner because now your income is predictable. And if you had kids and family members who could work the land, even better, security for you, that's how the economy sort of worked. But if you couldn't be a landowner, the next best thing, which is quite a bit worse, but still secure, was to be attached to the estate of a landowner, was to say, well, at least I've got some sort of fixed, dependable income. I've got, uh, it'd be like us saying, I've got steady employment. They would be connected with his estate. But what was worse than that was if you were not a landowner, not connected with anybody's estate that you could work, but you were essentially a day laborer, a day worker who every day had to go out to the marketplace hoping Somebody who was a landowner needed extra help. They needed extra work. So this is a story not about powerful people, but about people who are on the margins. This is a story about people who are dependent, who are needing someone to help them, give them work. And so as the story goes on, in verse 2 through 5, it says, After he agreed with the workers to pay them a denarian, he sent them into his vineyard. And then he went out around 9 in the morning and saw others standing around in the marketplace doing nothing. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is right. So less specific about the wage, but still, there's an agreement here. And they went. And again around noon. And then at three in the afternoon, he did the same thing multiple times. First thing in the morning, then at nine, then at noon, then at three. He's going out and he's getting people to join the work. He did the same thing. So the first observation I want to make from this parable is that participation in the kingdom looks like work, not leisure. <laughs> this is interesting, isn't it? Joining the kingdom, participating in God's reign, living under God's reign, does not look like having your feet propped up and your hands behind your head, sipping a virgin strawberry daiquiri or something like that as a, a mariachi band plays, you know, which is my ideal vacation. Participation in the kingdom, living under God's rule, looks like God saying to you, I've got a job for you. I've got an assignment for you. You get to get in on this. Now listen, this is, this is shocking maybe for some of us because we might think that work is the result of the fall. But work is not the result of the fall. Did you know that when God made Adam and Eve, he made them in his image so that they could extend and reflect his rule. Now we're gonna do a series later this summer about the whole of our lives being submitted and surrendered to God. And we'll talk about singleness and friendship and marriage. And we'll talk about work and all of this stuff. And so we'll do a whole sermon where we talk about work and how it is part of the kingdom creational design. But for today, all I want to say is that the, the notion of joining God in his work goes all the way back to Genesis 1. We were made in his image 
so that we could reflect his rule. This is like ancient rulers building pillars that, that, that were made in the image of the emperor so that a, a people in the far, farthest regions of the empire could know what their king was like. There's a job to be done here. And unlike other ancient stories that said human beings were made as slave labor, no, 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 the Genesis story says human beings were dignified in God's image and then given the job. There's a difference. We're not God's minions. We're not God's grunt labor. We're God's image bearers that we can express his rule in the world, right? So this whole story is built on a metaphor of work. And actually, it confronts our laziness, but it also confronts our workaholism. Because if we are our own boss, then we're just going to stay on the treadmill, stay on the hamster wheel, just keep working, working, working. But if it's God's kingdom, then it's his work. It's his harvest. It's his um, um, increase. It's his mission. But we get to join in it. We'll, we'll, we'll reflect on work more as the summer goes on. But then the rest of the story, you see another layer of focus. Verse 6, around 5 in the afternoon. So he's gone first thing in the morning, 9, noon, 3. Now at 5 in the afternoon, towards the end of the daylight working hours, he went and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you just standing around here doing nothing all day long? One translation says, why are you standing idle? This maybe is some of you, how you feel with your adult children living in your basement at the moment. No, I'm just kidding. Don't. Why are you just standing around? Of course, work today has changed quite a bit. You're, you're, why are you staring at your phone? No, I'm working. Social media stuff. My Insta famous. <laughs> why are you just standing around all day doing nothing? And then they say, because nobody has hired us, they replied. And he responded, okay, you also go into the vineyard. Here, here's something I want to say. The second observation from this parable is that actually purpose has to be received, not made up. Purpose has to be received. Somebody else has to give you your assignment in life. Somebody else has to say, this is what you are, you need to put your hands to right now. And here's why I think that matters in our age. There is a illusion or a notion that the highest good that a person could receive would be autonomy. The freedom to do what you would like when you would like. Total autonomy. And we think in our minds that this is the highest human good. If we all had 100% autonomy to direct our own steps, to determine our own course, to be the captain of our own fate and destiny, if that could happen, that is the highest human good. And because people believe that, they look at something like Christianity or Jesus and they say, oh, no, 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 I don't want something from the outside telling me what to do or telling me how to live. So any external direction is automatically oppression, right? Any external direction is like, oh, no, 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 that's oppressive because my highest good in my ethical framework, the highest good is total 100% autonomy. Now look around and see how that's working for people. Look around and see what that's producing. I suggest that what we're seeing is people who outwardly are filling their time, but in their souls have an idleness of spirit, a restlessness of spirit, outwardly busy. Let's go to this party. Let's do this thing. Let's just try out this thing. Let's go to this. But inside, it's like their spirit is just standing idly around. Why? Because you cannot make up the purpose for your own life. You, you can't actually script your own meaning. You're not the author of your own story. And actually, if we really think about it, it might be the most oppressive thing there is. To put this weight on a person and to say, hey, you get to determine every detail about your life and your destiny and your future and what good and evil is and all. Just put that on your shoulders. And we're like, oh. And we're crushing under the weight of it. And so now we have all of this inner angst about who should I date? Where should I go to college? Who should I marry? Is this the dream job? This is not my dream job. I, I, I had a, a, a Skype FaceTime thing with a, with a friend of mine who used to attend here and now works for um, a big social media company. 
that rhymes with Schmace book and uh, out in Silicon Valley. And, and, he, and he, said, he said, there's this illusion because all of us in Silicon Valley have been told that if you do something you love, it's not really work. And so all of us are forced to be forced. We're all working like 80, 90 hours a week. But on top of that, we have to pretend that we like it because none of us wants to actually say, this is work. And so we've been told, you know, so Facebook has like, you know, free food, like, like catered meals three times a day, like all of these amazing amenities and all this stuff. You're like, dude, can I get a job there? You know, because the whole idea is to say, nobody's really working here. We're just all hanging out and, and connecting. Meanwhile, the weight of giving your own life meaning is crushing us. The weight of having to be the one that says, I will decide my purpose. No, the, 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 a, a, a thing we observe in this parable is that these people are standing around because nobody has summoned them into a larger purpose. Can I say to you that Christianity is an invitation from the living God, the great sovereign over all, to join him in his work in the world. There is no higher purpose than that. And it looks like all kinds, amen. And it looks like all kinds of things. It could, it could look like being a student. It could look like being a teacher. It could look like being the parent that stays home in the care of children. It could look like being an accountant or a contractor. It could look like many different things. But the point is, we don't see our daily work the way everyone else sees their daily work. We see it as God has conscripted me into a larger story and a bigger purpose. I'm not trying to be the author of my own destiny. Purpose has to be received, not made up. But then the real sticking point of the parable are the next eight or nine verses. The real heart of this is all sort of kind of warming up here. What, by the time we get to verse eight, here's where it really begins to sting. <laughs> when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the workers and give them their wages. Now this is pretty standard operating procedure. End of the day, let's pay everyone. But then he says, beginning with the last ones hired, and moving finally to the first. This is not likely standard operating procedure. This is like unheard of. And there's a reason Jesus is telling the story this way. Because what would happen if he paid the people who were first, first? They'd take their wages and then they wouldn't know. They wouldn't know. But Jesus deliberately tells the story this way because he's setting up the climactic moment. And when those who were hired at five in the afternoon came, each one received a denarian. Now, when those who were hired first came, they thought they would receive more. On what basis? On something the master told them? No. On their own calculations of evenness and fairness, based on their own definition of what justice actually is. But each of them also received a denarian, and when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, and those who were hired, those who were hired last Worked one hour, they said. Don't you know, it's just an hour. And they received the same pay as we did, even though we had to work the whole day in the hot sun. But he replied to one of them, friend, I did you no wrong. Didn't I agree to pay you a denarian? Now take what belongs to you and go. I want to give to this one who was hired last the same as I give to you. Don't I have the right to do what I want? with what belongs to me? Or are you resentful because I am generous? Are you resentful because I'm generous? And so those who are last will be first and those who are first will be last. This is the third and most important thing to say about this parable. God is more generous than we deserve and actually more generous than we desire. More generous than we deserve. We're like, oh, thank you, God. Then he starts doing it for other people and you're like, mm. I don't know. <laughs> like God's generosity to you is always good news, but God's generosity to someone else makes you squirm. God's generosity to you, you're like, mm, God is so good. And then he's generous to someone else, and you're like, mm, I don't know, why them, Lord? Now, the context of this in Matthew's gospel is important because Matthew of the four gospels seems to have a Jewish audience in mind. And there's all kinds of clues about that. Matthew begins his gospel with Jesus' genealogy going back to Abraham. 
Uh, Matthew has Jesus' life intentionally ordered in a way that reenacts the Israel story. It's all there. And you wonder if Jesus is saying this as a way of saying, look, I know that the covenant people of God have had a long day. I know that the covenant people of God have been through exile. They've been through the quote unquote hot sun. They've been through some trials in their life with God. But in my mercy, I'm still going to save these people because they're my covenant people. I made a promise to them. Notice they're the first group that the master specifically makes a detailed promise with. There's a covenant sort of hint there. But the people who come in at five o'clock, who are those people? Those are the Gentiles. Those are the people that God is saying, did you forget that when I called Abraham, I said I was going to bless all the families of the earth through you? Did you forget that my generosity was meant for everyone? Our Old Testament reading this morning came from Isaiah 55, and he says, come and get bread and milk, buy it, quote unquote, with no money. And so they're like, oh, this is so great. And then the, as the reading went on, I don't know if you caught it, it started to say, a, a, a people who are not your people will come to you. Faraway lands, they're gonna come to you. And you're like, wait a minute, this is my bread. This is my milk that I didn't earn, that I didn't exactly buy. It just said, buy it, quote unquote, with no money. And other people are gonna come to you. You're like, well, you didn't tell me that. And Jesus is like, Isaiah said it, it was coming. This was always the plan. Which is what makes, you know, the story of Jonah toward the end of the Old Testament really remarkable because here a Jewish prophet goes to a Gentile people, reluctantly preaches, 100% of the people repent. Like best cruise evangelistic rally ever. And Jonah's mad about it. I mean, that shows you what happens to us. The, 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 the sense of religiosity gets into us. And we start to get possessive. This is my Jesus. This is my God. This is my grace. It's not for those wicked people. And Jonah gets resentful and says, I knew you were merciful. I mean, what? This is like comedic. Like, what? Normally, that's like God could have said to Jonah, you know, normally when people talk about my mercy, it, they're smiling. But this, you're, you're sulking about this. But this is what happens to us. And I think why it is, is because we have these finite human, narrow definitions of fairness. And God's generosity is better than our justice. God's generosity is actually better than our justice. You know why? Because our finite human definitions of justice is about even distribution, evenness. Everybody gets the same. God's generosity is about extravagance. There's more than enough to go around. More than enough. More than enough. More than enough. God's generosity is actually better than our justice. Here is this picture of a landowner the psalmist said, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. There's no higher landowner. But not only is God sovereign, he's generous. And if we're not offended by God's sovereignty, we're sure to be offended by God's generosity. To say, well, you're over everything. I guess it is all yours. I guess you can do what you want with what is yours, but I don't like it. I don't like, but God's generosity is better than our justice. You know, there's several, way, several ways that we could begin to check our hearts, and let the Holy Spirit kind of rattle cages. And I wanna take a step, and just maybe ruffle a little bit this morning, because we haven't done that yet, you know? It's just time, yeah. ruffle. Sometimes you hear things and you're like, oh, I don't know about that, that's going too far. Where are those places when generosity offends you? You know what I've discovered, just an observation, just layperson's observation? Sometimes we don't even care about the word justice because life is good for us. But the only time we bring up justice is when we think someone else is getting an unfair advantage. When they're being mistreated, we're silent about justice. 
When they're being oppressed, like, well, I don't know. They must have deserved it, you know. But when someone else is being the recipient of generosity, then we're like, oh, that, that is not fair. Let's talk about justice right now. And I think about a specific example here, the, his, the long history, hundreds of years of slavery and oppression and discrimination against African Americans in our country. And people try to make certain steps to say, well, maybe we should try to help, maybe we should try to, to, we want, well, just stop right there when the scales are even. Why? Wouldn't the gospel compel us to say, just go tip it the other way, just be generous? Wouldn't we find people that have been mistreated and oppressed and say, the goal is not to just sort of, let, let, no, no, let's not get carried away. Let's just get everything even. Wouldn't the gospel say, could you be over the top? Could you be lavish? Could you be extravagantly good and kind? Oh, well, I mean, I, is that very fair, brother? The gospel is not fair. It's not fair. Now, I'm, <laughs> yes. Now, I'm not here to tell you how all this works out in the details of your life, but I am here to ask you to check yourself when you're offended by someone else's generosity. When someone says, oh, why don't, why don't we go above and beyond? What? Well, isn't that just reversing? Isn't that just, shouldn't we just stop here? Listen, God is not a cold, calculating master. God is a generous business owner. Generous. Over the top. Let's, let's more than make up for it. Let's more than pour it out. Let's pour it out. I don't think Christians ought to be the voice of reason. I think Christians ought to be the voice of generosity. I think Christians ought to be the, the voice of extravagance. The ones who are saying, I don't know, let's do more. Can we do more? Let's do more. Well, hey, let's not get carried away now, brother. I think somewhere Jesus is saying, oh, let's do more. Paul I think picks up on how this messes with us. He knows that the more religious we get, the more calculating we get. He knows that the longer we've been associated with God, ironically, we start to believe a different kind of lie, and this is the lie that we deserved it. See, there's one kind of lie that says, we don't deserve it, I'm not, oh God, I'm nothing. Then you start, oh, you, you get churchified. You get churchified and you're in this thing and you're like, hmm, I do, I, I, you know what, I'm worth it. And you start imagining that God's grace was actually a calculated good investment. <laughs> that the father was a good mutual fund manager who scanned the globe and said, oh, Colorado Springs, lots of good prospects. Good family, check, promising job, let's go with that, okay, right pedigree, let's go. Oh, let's save them. Jesus, go die for them. Paul spends so much time in Romans trying to get the point across, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, whatever your background was, none of us deserved this. Romans 6, Paul gets really sharp. He says, when you were slaves of sin, you want to know who you were really working for? You were never working for God. Jesus said it pretty strongly in John's gospel. He called their father the devil. That's pretty strong. Paul says it a little gentler. You were slaves of sin. You were free from the control of righteousness. But what consequences did you get from doing things that you are now ashamed of? The outcome of those things is death. But now that you've been set free from sin and become slaves to God, you have the consequence of a holy life. And the outcome is eternal life. And then he says this phrase. And many of you have memorized. The wages that sin pays are death. But the gift, God's gift, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I hear Paul saying, yes, amen. I hear Paul saying to us today, you want to talk about wages? You want to talk about what the master owes you? Let's talk about wages. The only thing you deserve is death. The only wages you should have been paid is judgment. All of us are doomed. That's the only master we've been working for. We've been slaving away in the wrong vineyard. And our only paycheck should have been death. But God in his generosity gave us the gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus. None of us got here because we worked for it. 
None of us got here because we're worth it. None of us got here because we deserved it. All of us received a gift. Now a gift is simultaneously unsettling and the best news possible. And it's gonna, for, for some of you here today, it, it's gonna be a bit of both. For some of you, it's like, ooh, ooh that, that, that kind of rattled me a bit. Like, I don't know, like that's, <gasps> it's okay. That's what, that's the radical, that, it's what Paul calls the scandal of grace. It's scandalous. How can you give a good gift to someone who doesn't deserve it? Who does that? God does that. God does, it's scandalous. And it's also really good news. And maybe some of you are here today and, and you've, you've always thought of yourself as being on the edges of this thing, on the outer rim. You're like, okay, I'll go to church. But, but listen, I, I've logged too many miles. I've, I've worked too many hours. I've, I've been out in the sun. I, I've done the stuff that it's really, it's really should have disqualified me. I, I, I've, I have, I've been idle, been standing around. It really, really kind of disqualifies me, but, but, you know, maybe I'll just get in. Maybe the Lord will give me like a half a denarii. There is no half of the gift of grace. There is no half of the gift of Jesus. There is only Jesus. There is only grace. God's not calculating it. We, we don't have the kind of worldview that says God's going to have the cosmic scales. He's just going to say, Jesus, this is the gift of grace. This is the gift of eternal life. So some of you that are here, you're like, could it really be true for me? Yes. The answer is yes. I love that Travis and the team had us in childlike wonder this morning. I love that story. Oh, he loves us and how difficult that sometimes is for us to say that about him. And then we follow it up with a children's song that maybe your mother sang to you in the nursery room as they were rocking you to sleep. Jesus loves me, this I know. And, and maybe some of you are like, I don't know. Look, it's as childlike as that. Before you knew how to call on his name, he came for you. While you were yet sinners, Christ died. For us. God is more generous than we deserve, even more generous than we desire, but that is good news. Would you bow your heads this morning? Amen.